This is the Haggerty Rig. My name is Eric and this is the Haggerty Rig, aka the Super GoPro. The primary function of this rig is to get locked off high action, high intensity, high movement shots to get you that locked off look that a GoPro does but in a cinematic format in order to replicate or duplicate or draw some inspiration from Haggerty and Batman and all these other films that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and we ain't got that kind of money. So we're gonna figure out another way to do it. And if you guys wanted to get real wild and crazy, which I'm sure you do, you could run a dual mic setup with one in here in the cabin, one catching exhaust audio and wirelessly transmitting it back to the camera so everything's synced up like magic. The approximate cost of this rig as it sits with the Fujifilm X-T4, the Viltrox 23 millimeter prime lens, the filter that you're gonna need and the couple of suction cups along with a small rig cage is about $2,500. That's not calculating SD cards, extra batteries. If you wanna go with a different mount, a different rig, a different camera, that's how I'm running it. You can trim it down and get it a little bit more cost effective. That's how I've got it. And then as far as going up, I mean, the sky's the limit. You can find rigs similar to this running red cameras and different suction cup setups on professional productions. I mean like AAA movie productions, but we have trimmed it down, shrunk it down, made it a lot more cost effective, and I'm going to show you guys how I'm doing it. This rig is comprised of a couple of fat gecko mounts, a dual suction cup and a triple suction cup. On the triple suction cup, you can pull one of them off and bring it back down to a dual if you don't have enough mounting areas. I would never, ever, ever in a million years ever run this with only one mounting point. That's why it's in the cage. It gives us a way to triangulate and make this a lot more rigid. And I went with the fat gecko because cost effectiveness, reputation, and I have used this thing for quite some time with all sorts of different things and it's not failed me yet so long as I mount it correctly. How are we mounting it correctly? You need a good clean and slick prep surface. I use because it's cost effective and easy to find is the Meguiar's Ultimate Waterless Wash and Wax. I've been using this for quite some time, this same bottle for probably two or three years now. And then a clean microfiber. This one's not clean anymore. Keep in mind the function of microfibers is to capture and then not release any sort of dirt or particulate. So you can wash it a time or two and get a couple more uses out of it, but it's really not made to wash clean. It's made to capture it, never let it go. So my point is don't overuse this or you'll end up leaving scratches in paint. Uh, you'll end up not having a good prep surface. You'll end up oversaturating your microfibers and redepositing old dirt onto a surface that you need to be clean. Wash it a couple times and then maybe trickle it down to some in-house activities, wipe a tractor down with it, you know, something less critical than this, but don't keep using this, especially on new cars, please don't. By far the most important part of this rig that is gonna be overlooked by most people if you don't actually watch this part is going to be a CPL filter, a circular polarizing filter. The second most important is gonna be an ND filter preferably a variable ND filter so that you can control the exposure level inside the cabin of your vehicle. Always manual set this, don't leave it on auto, it's gonna expose for the daylight and everything around it. But let me show you all the power of a CPL filter and let me recommend, I'm not affiliated with these guys, I'll be leaving links to all, all of this stuff down below to make it easy for you all. But the best one I've found for this and most of my automotive work has been a KNF concept it is a dual filter. This is a variable ND with a circular polarizer built in. And so you can put this on and then you have a variable ND to adjust how much light's getting through to the lens. It's a two to 32. 
And then on top of that, it has a circular polarizer in addition. So I've got two filters here in one and it is threaded on the front. It does go up a size. So if your base thread is a 52, it up threads it to a 58 on the outbound side, but that's completely fine. And now if you want, you can run your glimmer glass, your, your black pro mist, um, another additional like four stop ND if this two to 32 isn't quite enough. Gotta have this, got to have this if you're gonna be shooting through glass. Absolutely 100% necessary. And when you set your circular polarizer and you're facing a certain direction, if there is a major shift in where the sun is positioned, like if you're shooting for hours, double check it. You're gonna have to adjust your CPL. If you're doing some kind of track driving and you want your primary focus is to get this one corner, this one chicane or a long stretch, whenever you're doing your initial setup, face your vehicle in the same way that it's gonna be going and your critical point, adjust your CPL because whenever you're going around the other side of the track or wherever you're gonna be, it's not going to be polarizing the light correctly. So you have a window in which the CPLs operate optimally through through glass, especially this high reflective, super thick, probably has some tint on it, automotive glass. So you can put these things in some pretty precarious situations and get away with it. For the sake of the shot, just be careful about what you're doing, especially if you're filming around the general public. Don't let your your version of risk become a version of risk for the general public. If you're going to be doing stuff where cameras might fall, uh, maybe don't do it. Or if you just got to do it for the shot, do it somewhere where if something catastrophic happens, there's nobody else at risk except who is actually involved and willing to take that risk. It's just something you have to consider. Something else you need to consider is <laughs> whenever you're mounting this up, be aware of what moves and what doesn't move. Or basically, I have one set of suction cups attached to my front windshield and another on the door. That's great. Um, this is not the most ideal mounting point, but it's gonna work for some shots. But I can't open my door. Or well, I can, but not without breaking something. Either I'm gonna break loose the suction cups, the camera's gonna fall, or more likely I'm gonna break my mirror because it's a 13 year old General Motors plastic. So keep all that in mind. Be cautious, but still get the shots that you want. <sighs> I gotta crawl back out. Uh, do I do this ass first or? Oh man, I'm gonna break something. Uh, and not in the truck either. It's gonna be me. I'm gonna break something in me. So ideally you wanna keep your package, your camera package as small and light as possible while still getting the look that you want, which is gonna include camera and lens selection. And also you're gonna want the suction cups as spread as far apart. You're gonna want the mounting points as far apart. So one on the bottom, one on the side, one on the bottom, one on the top. Um, because the closer they are, the easier it's gonna be able to, for it to rock around on that mount. And the further apart these suction cups are, think of it as like a, like a pad. It's, it's got more leverage against the rocking motion of the camera. Tighten everything down as tight as you can without causing damage or getting something stuck. But I did want to mention, if you all are thinking about running a large cinema lens, one, you're going to have a little bit more difficulty controlling the shake. But if you want to roll those dice, which I have before with great results in small portions of the footage, less percentage of the captured footage was keeper shots, but it was a good looking, it was a good looking shot. So if you guys wanna try that, I would highly recommend getting a base plate for your uh, rig here, your cage, so that you can put a couple of rods and then a lens support bracket. Why? You're gonna support the lens up front and also this is gonna give you a couple more mounting options down below on this setup here. That way you've got now, instead of just holding on to the base, because remember your actual cage is only holding on to the base and then maybe hugging the sides of the camera. Now you've got another point where your cage is making contact with the camera setup, which is gonna be near the front of that big heavy cinema lens. A couple of final pieces of vital information that you need to understand is that this is not 
going to work with every camera system. Rolling shutter is the biggest issue. So with my X-T4 in 30 frames per second, it does pretty good. And in 60 frames per second, it actually does really good. The X-T5 is gonna do terrible. The X-T3 is gonna perform the same as the X-T4. The X-H2S is gonna perform even better. High readout speeds are absolutely imperative. Why? So whenever you're having micro jut judders or jitters or shakes, the camera, the sensor is either going to move and read out so fast that that whole sensor is moving or pretty close to it. And you're just kind of, the camera's along for the ride and it's able to capture everything that looks similarly enough to the, what the eye sees that it's not gonna be jarring. It's gonna be filmic, cinematic. You're gonna go along for the cinematic journey with your audience. You're gonna take them there. If you have a high readout speed or AKA a, a high rolling shutter, every time the camera gets jostled, instead of that whole sensor going along with it and reading out fast enough to where between frames, the whole sensor is caught back up, it's gonna look jello-y and wobbly and almost VHS-like in certain scenarios. And so you have to pay attention to your readout speeds uh, another thing is IBIS, in-body Im image stabilization, and even worse, lens stabilization, or the combination of the two. I highly recommend turning that off. The overwhelming majority of the cameras are gonna have significant issues with this, and even if you have a high sensor readout speed, aka low rolling shutter, the idea is that it's locked to the vehicle, the object that the camera is locked to not locked in space. And so these are gonna be using gyroscopics and things like that to measure where it is. It's gonna make it look like you're kind of, the camera's kind of floating around. And finally, before I send you guys off, if you have already wiped down the car and any amount of time has passed, also hit the suction cups. Don't lather them up with your, your wipe down, your wash and wax if you're gonna use the same thing I am. Just do a simple, quick wipe to get off any dust, dirt, debris, pollen if you're in a pollinated area like I am out here in East Texas. But if you have not wiped down the vehicle, wiped down the suction cups and immediately mounted it, Rewipe it. The car just sitting there. It's going to start accumulating stuff, and you don't want any unforeseen issues or debris to break suction off of your suction cups. This goes back to why I would always dual mount and I would use at least four suction cups. That way, you could have one, maybe two suction cups fail without dropping the rig on the ground. This one was short, sweet, and to the point. I'm gonna try and do that more and more, cut down on your guys' screen time and get straight to the good stuff. So if you like that, drop a like. Leave a comment down below if you want me to cover something else or have a question about what I covered in this video, subscribe to stay on top of all my new content. I'm gonna try and get some more out there to you guys. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day.